Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to see so many of you here. Um, we, are, we are blessed with a wonderful guest tonight. Before I present him, I'd like to say a few words about the Buckley program. My name is Rich Lazardo. I'm the president of the program. We have a mission of promoting intellectual diversity, as many of you know. It's a mission that's increasingly relevant in the age of Brandeis University uh, and redacting its honorary degree, and uh, as well as the upcoming vote tonight with a pro-life organization in the umbrella uh, social justice group. And so uh, we, we do this mission, we strive to achieve this mission through a number of ways, most notably our lecture series, our speaker series through lectures, seminars, dinners and debates. And um, we also do, uh, we also sponsor internships for the summer and we have community service opportunities. Uh, so Buckley Fellows, stay tuned. There are a couple coming up for the end of the semester. So um, now on to our guest. Mr. Scarborough, uh, you've surely seen him on TV. He's the host of MSNBC's Morning Joe, the, the conservative voice on um, the, uh, the network that all conservatives love. Um, we have, uh, he's, you've also seen him in print. He's a New York Times bestselling author. And a number of fellows have gotten free books, uh, The Right Path, his latest book. And it's available for purchase at, at the end of the event. Uh, Mr. Scarborough will be signing. And last, lastly, you've seen him in Congress. He was a representative from Florida, and so uh, back in the 90s. So without further ado, present Joe right. Scarborough. Well, for me. Um, for those of you who don't know how uh, my career started in Congress, I'm from Northwest Florida, um, which is also known as the Redneck Riviera, um, LA, Lower Alabama. Um, some people call it AA America's Albania, but we don't go there. Um, I got elected in 94, and I ran in a district that had not elected a Republican since 1873. And uh, they hung the last one that they sent up there. So, it was an uphill battle, but when I ran, I remember telling my parents that I was going to run against Earl Hutt, who was this good old boy, congressman, and, uh, and said, I, I want to go up to Washington and make a difference. And I, 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 I want to run against Earl Hutt, because I think he's rubber stamping everything that Bill Clinton said in his way. And I remember my dad I telling him, well, that's great, Joey, but I'm voting for Earl. <laughs> um, I got my mom's vote. I found out in 1994 you didn't need your dad's vote to be elected to Congress. You just needed a picture of your opponent with Bill Clinton. And I had it. So I, I campaigned against Bill Clinton the whole time. Of course, the guy drove me crazy. He goes, I'll feel your pain. And I'd be like, he's lying. You know he's lying. And of course, I won. I went up to Washington. And then the first thing you do is you meet Bill Clinton. And it's just horrible. If you hate Bill Clinton, it's a horrible thing to do. Because his hands are up. I sure do. I sure do love Pensacola, Congressman. I love you. And his hands are all over you. Doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. And you know, seduce me. I was like Lady Macbeth. Go home and try to get the stain out. I just, just, but I was just in love. I fell in love with the guy. But I snapped too in time to actually save myself and not be primary. Uh, the next the next time around. And you know, we actually got some things done in the 1990s uh, with a Democratic president that didn't really like a Republican Congress and a Republican Congress that didn't really like a Democratic president. And uh, we got some things done. I, 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 I'll be the first to admit, a lot of people will say, now all the Tea Partiers, they're, they're so different than you guys were back in the 1990s. No, they weren't. No, we were, we were horrible to Bill Clinton. I, I admit it. I called his chief of staff and said, you know, I said, told him, I, it, you know, it was Erskine Bowles. I said, Erskine, I hate to admit it to you, but I can't stand your boss. I hate him. And Erskine said, don't worry about a congressman. He hates you, too. <laughs> and he did. But we worked together, and we figured out a way, even through all the political battles, to balance the budget for the first time in a generation, Balanced it four years in a row for the first time since the 1920s. We passed welfare reform. We cut taxes, regulatory relief, and did a lot of good things. I think most importantly, we got out of the way 
So businesses could create 21 million new jobs in the 1990s. We don't have that level of cooperation in Washington, D.C. right now. We don't have that level of cooperation because Democrats and Republicans don't trust each other. Their feet are in cement. Now, I'm a conservative guy with a small C, and I'm a conservative guy with a big C. But we have to start electing leaders that can get things done. We've got to start electing leaders that actually aren't afraid to strike a deal if it's a deal where they can get 60 to 80 percent of what they want. You know, there's a, a, there's a Reagan quote that's always misused. So don't do this. Don't say, don't say, well, you know, Ronald Reagan said just because I'm with you 80 percent of the time doesn't mean I'm your enemy 20 percent of the time. What Reagan actually said was, I'll take 80 percent now and I'll go back later and try to get the other 20 percent. Reagan was conservative with a big C. He was conservative with a small C. And the message that I'm giving to Republicans and I'm giving to conservatives when I go around, whether it's in New Hampshire or whether it's in Kansas or whether it's in California, <clears throat> is that we've got to get our feet out of cement. We, we've got to stop being overly ideological because William F. Buckley, I'm sure a lot of you know the quote, I have it in my, my most recent book, Buckley himself said, ideology is a very dangerous thing the closer it gets to reality. And we have been overly ideological. We've not been willing to figure out how to apply conservatism, the eternal truths, to modern realities. And that's why we've lost five out of this last six elections. I think in part, Mitt Romney's biggest problem was that Mitt Romney and a lot of people in the Republican Party really do believe the 47% line. They don't believe like Reagan believed. They don't believe like Buckley believed. They don't believe like Hayek believed. They don't believe like Friedman believed. They don't believe like conservatives believe. It's actually conservatism. Less government, less taxes, more economic freedom, leaving more choices in the hands of local communities, small business owners, individuals, families, is just as important to a 17-year-old Latino in South Central LA as it is to a 65-year-old hedge fund broker in Greenwich, Connecticut. In fact, if you really believe what I believe, you know that actually conservatism is more important to the 17-year-old Latino in South Central LA than the 65-year-old hedge fund broker in Greenwich, Connecticut, because the 65-year-old hedge fund broker in Greenwich, Connecticut is going to have all the lawyers and all the accountants and all the consultants to take care of it. But we have to start believing that in our heart, and we have to start applying that in a way and speaking in a way that relates to middle-class Americans and working-class Americans. Because simply saying, I'm for less taxes and less regulation and more freedom, just isn't going to get it anymore. Talking about Ronald Reagan just isn't going to get it anymore. Ronald Reagan got elected in 1980. Damn, I couldn't math. The University of Alabama. 32 years ago? Was that 32 years ago? What year is this? <laughs> Oh my god, I was thinking it was 2012. Is that bad? I don't even know what season it is. Maybe it's because there's snow on the ground this morning. I'm from Florida. I wake up in New Canaan. There's snow on the ground. Jesus, why is thou forsaken me? That's awful. But it's been, so it's been 34 years. 34 years since Ronald Reagan was elected. We need, we need to look forward. We need to tell people what's going to happen in this country over the next 34 years. And we haven't done it. We have to do more than just tell Americans what we're against. Because I'm living proof that in congressional elections, you can beat something with nothing. But if you want to change America in presidential elections, you have to have a program. 
You have to explain to Americans what you want to do with health care. You have to explain to Americans how you want to make the tax code more fair. You have to explain what your foreign policy is. It can't just be we're against what those people are doing. You have to have a very real vision. And one other thing, I'll say one other thing that I say to conservatives and I say to Republicans as a bit of a challenge. We also, even though I'm a conservative with libertarian leanings, it's all right to say there are some things that the federal government can actually do right. I think, I think back to the story of Ike, 1957, after Sputnik. What did Ike do? He decided to invest a little bit in science. And he created a new generation of scientists, mathematicians, uh, and engineers. And because of what Ike did back in the 50s, in 57, 58, the investments he made in education, in science, four years later, five years later, John Kennedy could say that by the end of the decade, we're going to send a man to the moon. And we did. And at the end of the decade, in July of 1969, when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, the average age of the scientists and the engineers and the mathematicians in mission control in Texas was 28. And after they left NASA, they went out and they did great things. They, with all apologies to Al Gore, they helped invent things like the internet as we know it today. And they transformed America. We can't be afraid at times to strike deals with our political rivals that actually will do what will help Americans. I think our biggest challenge now is far different than my challenge when we were in Congress. Economically, the federal debt, we're going to have to face entitlement programs and we're going to have to tell the truth about entitlement programs. We can't just keep cutting here, a little bit here, and a little bit there. We can't just cut the 12% that's domestic discretionary spending. We're going to have to go where the money is. And the fact is, entitlement programs are growing too fast. And for, for those of you that are under 30, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security taken together will cripple this country and bankrupt this country before you can draw a dime out of it. We're going to have to figure out how to reform it how to slow down costs and make it fair. Anyway, let me, let me go ahead, though. I, I, I could talk. I've got a three-hour talk show in the morning, and I literally could talk for about six hours. I'd prefer to open it up and, and answer any questions you have. And you raise your hand way too fast, dude. i got to go somewhere else. Anybody else? Because if somebody raises their hand before you're finished speaking, you know you're in trouble. Go ahead. You need to back away. <laughs> don't, don't get too close to it. Sorry, I'm from New Hampshire, so we're used to the whole town hall style format. Uh, one of the things you talked about. Oh, that's too low. Okay. Dude, dude. Cool. All right. Um, so, one of the things you talked about is that the importance of compromise. And as someone who's a political operative and worked on political campaigns, running a congressional campaign right now, um, compromise is something we all would like to see, but it's mm -hmm. actually. There's a lot of institutions on the right right now that are willing to skewer anyone who even mentions compromise. Mm -hmm. um, one instance was particular that strings through to me was that someone, uh, I was working for a campaign once, that the candidate had slightly less than hardcore conservative on gun issues, mm -hmm. and which was, it was completely on the right, but you know, 95% instead of 100%. The one of the uh, super PAC groups took the 5%, mm -hmm. sent it out to the entire gun association nationally, right. and our office lines were jammed, and our mailbox was jammed for the next week by this one issue, by this one national mail that they did. So what kind of advice do you have for actually being able to sell a compromise, especially to those specific groups or one issue groups on the right, right. that are designed to prevent it? It's a great question, and I'm glad you asked it. So much, of, so much of it has to do with the way that you approach it. And for years we beat Democrats that would run for president because they were afraid to admit that they were liberal. And so you'd have John Kerry talking about voting 
for a war, before voting against a war, before voting for a war. And you just sit there and laugh at them because it happened every four years. We're now the ones doing it. Here's the rule. Here's the rule. If you're running for office or if you're running a campaign and somebody has to make a tough decision, nobody, nobody ever stops you when you're going 90 miles an hour. I've said it time and time again. Nobody ever stops you when you're going 90 miles an hour. I may, you know, I'm a guy that had a 100% NRA rating. Um, I was, I was the, you know, I, I was is as pro-gun, pro-Second Amendment as you could possibly be, after Newtown, I supported background checks. And not only did I support background checks, I went all in. And I hammered the NRA when they did some extraordinarily stupid things uh, that actually hurt people like myself that, you know, I agreed with them 95, 96, 97 percent of the time but went after him aggressively, and, and you just have to do it. If you go out, if, you, if, if you're going to jump, you can't jump halfway off a cliff. You have to go after it, and you have to do it aggressively. And, I, you know, that happened to me when I was in Congress. There were a lot of times that I was from a conservative district, but there were a lot of votes that I made that people didn't understand. And I knew on those votes I had to be unbelievably aggressive. That's, that's why Democrats are going to get in a lot of trouble if they try to run away from Obamacare. If they voted for it, you know, they can't have it both ways. So that would, you know, that, that would, I, I think also there's a second part of it, there's a logistical part of it too. You have to anticipate those attacks. If I were ever to run in a Republican primary again, before I did, I would be ready on, for instance, the gun issue. On, on background checks. And so, but that's the key. You've got to be, you got to be aggressive. I've got a follow-up too. Yes. It, 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 to me, it's, while well, I, I completely agree that it's the, you're dealing with these specific institutions on the right mm -hmm. that are promoting this. It, it's almost something that we're doing to ourselves where we have right. these organizations that are generally single issue organizations in that role. For a small campaign, a congressional campaign that we have 10 chapters, right. we'll be able to completely overwhelm them mm -hmm. uh, from, a, you know, from a logistical point of view to the point where you're not able to function with any of them on the left. And what is the way that we can, I, I completely agree with you on the necessity of compromise, the, 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 the necessity of incrementalism, but how do we convey that message to some of those institutions on the right? Well, I mean, you're not going to, and you're not going to because they have an economic incentive. I mean, if, 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 if they're a single issue uh, advocacy group, they have an economic and a political uh, reason to be, to be extreme. And, and that's something that, you know, you have, to, you have to realize and whoever's running the campaign has to realize as well. And the choice has to be made sometimes. Sometimes, listen, sometimes, we're going to have to fight people on our own side. I don't I have to tell a lot of you what William F. Buckley did in the 1960s. He went to war with the John Birch Society. He went to war with a lot of libertarians. He went to war with a lot of people that called themselves conservatives that he didn't think uh, were, were good for the cause. And that's the, same thing that, that's the same thing that has to happen. But at the end of the day, again, it's if... I, I, I don't know if you survive by going 90 miles an hour uh, against some of these groups. It depends on what the group is and, and the realities of the race on the ground. But I do know this, sort of going halfway in there, being mealy-mouthed, apologizing for what you believe in, just never works. So. Thank you. Um, while he's getting there, so yeah. um, nice to see you in person. Really, it's nice to really, see you in really person good. too. I've okay. I've, I've wanted yeah, to see you for course. a long time yeah. now, and yeah. you know I I I'm thought glad you heard about me. I thought that you would be tall. Just I'd heard about you, and I thought you would be tall, and I thought you'd dress very well. And I get uh, you know 
I was half right. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm joking. Touche. Touche. I'm joking. I was in pajamas an hour ago. Go ahead. You're right. You're right. Had a rough morning. Anyway, uh, love the contrast between the um, 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 well, the Latino kid and the hedge fund manager. Uh, it was a, a very nice uh, juxtaposition. What do you think um, we should do as conservatives? What is your position on the export-import bank? Should we? Uh, Support the rechartering of the bank. Or what do you think? Should we stri strike a deal? I, I want to hear from I you. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I want you to guide us through this. I can't guide you through that. I would love to. There are many things I could guide you through, but the rechartering of the import export bank way above my pay grade. So what do you think? I don't know. I'm asking. Does anybody here know whether we should recharter the I'll import play. export bank? Is that a yes? Yes. You know what? Let me tell you something. <laughs> This is a good example, okay, 90 miles an hour. Let me tell you something, we gotta do it. And I don't give a damn what Barack Obama says, what Eric Holder says, I don't care what the editorial page of the New York Times says, the future of this country may depend on the rechartering of the import-export bank. Thank you very much, how's that? 90 miles an hour. And just pray to God they don't ask you a question you have no clue the answer to. Joe, can I ask a question about your show? Yes. <laughs> Something that drives me crazy every morning. Are you going to bring up Mika? No. Nope. Okay. No, nope. I'm going to bring up when you go have breakfast, and then they bring on someone that uh, uh, leaves the, uh, the dais empty of, uh, of a market-oriented person. Could you please get someone, um, one more person, uh, when, when, when you're in the Riviera or having breakfast uh, uh, coverage? Are you suggesting there are too many liberals around me? Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> you know, sometimes, seriously, sometimes I actually go off and just let Mika and the liberals have free run of it for about 10, 15 minutes because it is, uh, it's, it, it just, it's exhausting after a while. Being surrounded by five or six liberals. Let me ask, how many, how many people actually have seen the show? Okay, so, yeah, okay, great. So some Morning Joe people here. So you guys know that what makes the show actually work is when there is a balance between Mika and myself. Because um, Mika is, obviously, she is a Northeast liberal. I'm a Southern conservative. Um, her dad ran U.S. foreign policy for four years. My dad ran Little League baseball teams for a year. I was raised in the Southern Baptist Church, as I told you all. Amen, and all the people said, Hey man, what are you doing at Yale? <laughs> I saw a Reese Witherspoon movie where she went to Harvard Law School, but I didn't know they let any in there. <laughs> Yale, you're from Mississippi. I'm from Mississippi. <laughs> I lived in Meridian, Mississippi for four years. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> so I'm from, I'm from the Deep South, Southern Baptist. Amen. Meek, of course, was raised in a lot of young Marxist League meeting houses and. <laughs> the greater Manhattan area. So variety is a spice of life. But Mississippi, good for you. Yes, sir. Uh, so I appreciate the message that we shouldn't be looking back to Reagan as much as we are, and we should look forward. Uh, who do you see today, uh, now that everyone's lining up for 2016, who you think could plausibly pick up that mantle and like be the figure of conservatism for the next 34 years? I don't know if he can now. I can tell you when I worked with him back 10 years ago, Jeb Bush was a guy that had the formula the down, which is this formula. Reagan was a genius because he was conservative ideologically, but he was moderate temperamentally. That is so important. Jeb was the same way conservative ideologically, moderate temperamentally, it made a huge difference. You know, William F. Buckley, 1964, he went all in for Barry Goldwater. All in, Barry Goldwater got stomped. And the day after the election, all of the newspapers, all of the newspapers across America were talking about how Barry Goldwater's nomination and the landslide victory against him by LBJ was going to end conservatism for a generation. You know why it didn't? Because two years later, the same agenda, the same ideological platform was trotted out to the people of California in 1966, two years later. 
and Ronald Reagan won a landslide, saying the same things that Barry Goldwater said two years earlier. What was the difference? It was temperament. It was a sunny optimism. The conservative message was important. It was the time for the message to be heard. But Goldwater couldn't deliver it. And Buckley understood that. And he realized that. And it was an important two years in his life. Because it was William Buckley, a year later, that was going out to California and actually defending Ronald Reagan against conservatives that said he was a big government sellout. So that's what we have to look for. It's a simple formula. Conservative ideologically, moderate temperamentally. And I must say, as a Republican that suffered through one too many presidential debates over the past 25 years, it would also be good to get a nominee that knows how to complete a sentence. <laughs> we had Reagan in 88, that's great. I mean, Reagan in, 80, in 84. 88, George H.W. Bush, I love him. Everybody loves 41. But go back and look at the tapes. The debates were horrible. There was an SNL skit where John Lovett played Michael Dukakis and turned to the Bush character and said, I can't believe I'm losing to this guy. Because <laughs> Bush was such a horrible debater. It got no better. 1996, Bob Dole, an American hero. God bless him. I love him. He was terrible debating. And I really do think Jack Kemp a hero of mine must have dropped acid before the vice presidential debate because he was awful too. And George W. Bush, God, God, who are these men, as they say at the end of the verdict? Who are these men? So it's not only important that we get somebody who's conservative ideologically and moderate temperamentally, but somebody that can take the intellectual fight to the Democrats. And we haven't had that in a long, long time. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with Jeb. But he's certainly somebody, when he was governor of Florida, I never saw a fight that Jeb shied away from. But he was always the guy that put the Democrats, that put the liberals back on their heels. And we'll see, we'll see if he can do that. We'll see if he runs. We'll see if he can do that this year. that I noticed was very effective about Reagan is that he was able to translate these very intellectual concepts to the average person and to connect the social conservatism of the working class and maybe even today that could translate to minorities from economic issues instead of just having all these highfalutin you know oh well 70 percent of your taxes go to entitlements and because right. of you know and then supply side you know, no one cares about that, right? right? So how do we today, you know, we have the Georgia primary coming up, and there are, I'm from Georgia, also Southern Baptist, um, the South- By the way, we're gonna have a tent revival right outside afterwards. <laughs> Everybody's invited, but Methodist and Lutheran. We're, we're suspicious, we don't, even, we don't know if you really believe in Jesus or not. I'm sorry, go ahead. We don't, we don't do that. Um, Go ahead. So the, the southern two-thirds, I was about to say half, but it is actually bigger, um, of Georgia is filled with lower income, like really low income right. people and a lot of minorities too. And so they're thinking that in Georgia, something that's con just like seen as a considerably conservative state, you know, the Democrats have a huge chance of winning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that we have a big problem with, if we want to talk about social issues, we come across as not moderate in, temper, in temperament. We right. come across as just, we're against this, 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 and this, and naysayers. Right. When we talk about economics, we're boring. So, yeah. you know, how do we translate, you know, that economics into the social things that people really care well, about? Well, you, you know, the, the thing that I, I, I've been amused by, and I was amused by, you know, we lost the Hispanic vote in such a huge way in 2012. And everybody acts, you know, say, well, the Republicans have lost Hispanics for a generation. It's just nonsense. And suddenly our great idea was, hey, let, I get, we got a great idea. Let's get a Hispanic member of the Senate to go out and talk about immigration reform. Come on, give me a break. It's that kind of thinking is how Democrats think. It's how liberals think. 
It's the balkanization of, of, of the American electorate. I saw uh, Wendy Davis had a front page glowing piece on New York Times Magazine. And she was talking about her challenge. She said, well, you know, part of the challenge is that we have so many different groups that we have to talk to. Uh, you know, young Hispanic women, 18 to 34, have different needs than, uh, than African-American males, 35 to 64, and blah, 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 blah. Let me tell you something. If you believe, and I say, I, I say this to my conservative friends, that say, oh, you know, the demographics, and I, just between us <coughs> boys and girls here, you know, I, I did a national review lunch. And I was shocked by what a couple of people inside this lunch were saying. Like saying, it's over for the Republican Party. We can't win national elections anymore. The demographics are, said, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And that's when I started thinking about the 17-year-old Latino in South Central LA. It's relevant. What we believe in, less taxes and less government burden, is just as relevant to every demographic group. And we've got to believe that. We've got to be optimistic enough to believe that Hispanic mom and dad want the same thing as an African-American mom and dad, want the same thing as an Asian-American mom and dad, want the same thing as a Caucasian mom and dad. Because you know what? They do. I've talked to some of them. <laughs> they love their children, too. <laughs> Don't tell anybody they want their children to do better than them. They want them to go to a good school, get a good job, live in a good neighborhood, and have more opportunities than they have. And any conservative that believes that message does not apply across Every demographic group needs to find another cause. Because in the wrong movement, they're in the wrong party. And so, well, you know, we've got to stop being intellectually lazy. That's the answer. We're intellectually lazy. I see Republican ads, and I have to switch the channel. Because it's the same thing Republicans were saying in the 80s. It's the same thing Republicans were saying in the 90s. It's the same thing that Republicans have been saying for 30 or 40 years. Don't tell me you're for less taxes, less regulation, more freedom, cut the debt, blah, 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 blah. Tell me how those policies, connect those policies to working class Americans, not upper middle class Americans, not rich Americans. I gotta be honest with you, I don't care about rich Americans. They're gonna take care of themselves. They really are. Are you rich? Are you pissed off at me now? Or? And all the people said, amen. The thing is, they're going to be able to take care of themselves. But we as Republicans, we as conservatives, let me say, have to think anew. And we have to get candidates that will go out there and say, you know what? It's immoral for the federal government to take 40, 50 percent of people's taxes, uh, of people's earnings and taxes. But we also should be able to say it's immoral for billionaires to pay 14 percent tax rate while their secretaries pay 28%. Now, there may be some people here that actually care about carried interest, and you may be offended by what I just said. You were not the 1%. You were the 0.00001%. Because that's just not right. So, the banks, it wouldn't hurt to have a candidate. John Huntsman was the only one in 2012 that actually says, you know what? The banks that were too big to fail are now even bigger. So what do we need to do? We need to break up the banks. And we actually have to send a message to the banks after we break them up that the rules of the market apply to you too. Just like they apply to a small business owner. We're not going to preach, uh, we're not going to preach capitalism to single moms that are struggling to get by and practice socialism to the largest five banks in America. And it is socialism. When you have the federal government step in and bail out banks 
for acting badly for five, six, seven years, wrecking the economy, wrecking the world economy for five years. Americans are still struggling to get back to where we were in 2007, 2008. So why is it that our party refle reflexively believes that we need to go out and campaign and stay away from these issues? Right, exactly, exactly. So guess what? If you're a candidate, and if you're, or if you're running a campaign, actually sit down and think through it. And do a radical thing, do what I did. I knocked on doors. It's an amazing thing, knocking on doors. I didn't have money to win an election, so I went out and I knocked on 10,000 doors. But I didn't need to knock on 10,000 doors to figure out what people were thinking about in my district. I had to knock on about five or six, because after you knock on five or six, and you realize that three or four people are saying the same exact thing and phrasing it the same exact way, you know how to run your campaign. And I knew, I knew the issues. I couldn't afford polls, guess what? I didn't need polls. Because I was sitting down at dinner with people across Northwest Florida and they were telling me what they thought about taxes, what they thought about war, what they were concerned about most with the economy, what they were concerned the most about with health care. And I could go and people would ask questions and I was able to relate there. So yeah, you're not, you're not going to get the answer from you know, a focus group in Washington, D.C. So again, but so much of it, I've got to go back to it, so much of it just has to do with the intellectual laziness of the conservative movement. And I will say it again, the intellectual laziness of the conservative movement. There were times when the conservative movement intellectually, was where all the action was. It was certainly that way when Buckley started the National Review in the mid-50s. It was that way in the early 1980s. The Heritage Foundation, my God, it was actually exciting. There were conservatives debating conservatives about the best way to reform health care, the best way to reform education, the best way to do all these things. We have this group think now. And I will say it, I don't want to offend anybody, so I won't name any names. But we have this group think, the left has it too. But a group think that is created by talk radio, that's called, created by blog sites, that's created by special interest groups, that's created by cable news channels, that if you step outside the very tight lines of how you were supposed to think intellectually, you are a traitor to the cause. They fought like hell at the Heritage Foundation in the 1980s. They did the same thing at National Review. Did Bill Buckley go out and get a bunch of right-wingers to write for him? No. He had Gary Wills, Joan Didion. He had great intellectual writers, and they wrestled with issues. And they weren't afraid to have an intellectual battle. We don't have that in the conservative movement now. We just don't. It's just, it's straight down the line. You know, back in the days before you all were in college or high school or probably even middle school, we would also, conservatives would also laugh at Democrats because there was one liberal who famously said in 1972, after Richard Nixon won 49 states, that she didn't know how they did it because she didn't know a single person who voted for Richard Nixon. And we just laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. And liberals would do that every four years. I, you know, I remember 1980, uh, I was very young then. I remember 1980, uh, ABC Newsman was on there and Reagan was winning in a landslide. And he actually looked, he goes, what is happening out there? He had no clue. Um, 2004, Democrats were sure, and by Democrats I mean members of the national press, were sure John Kerry was going to win. They saw the exit polls. They were shocked again that a Republican won again. They lived in this bubble 
and it was this echo chamber. And they would hear each other's voices, and they would assure themselves, and they would put themselves to sleep at night that they were going to win the election because the Republicans and the conservatives were right-wing nuts, and Americans could not connect with them. Do you know what's happened now? We're the ones in the bubble. And if you don't believe we're the ones in the bubble, then just go back and look at what the Drudge Report was saying for the month before the election. Mitt Romney up by 47%. <laughs> Coral Rove, like after the election was over, was saying there's still a chance the Confederacy can storm to victory. <laughs> South Carolina. South Carolina, baby. Mm. Of South Carolina. And New Hampshire and Iowa and Nevada. Um, <laughs> The Romneys, election night. I love the Romneys, but Ann Romney was shocked. Election night. She was sure, even late into the night, that they were going to win. Everybody in that bubble was. Why? Because guess what? They, they were watching Fox News. They were listening to talk radio. I remember getting absolutely destroyed by right-wing media. Absolutely destroyed. Because I said after the convention, that it may not have been the smartest thing to have Clint Eastwood stare at a chair <laughs> in prime time. You won? I mean, and I actually wrote a column talking about, because I knew all the people in the Romney campaign saying we're in trouble. The Romney campaign's in trouble. It's in disarray. They don't know what the message is. The candidate's family can't figure out how to get the, their father's message out. I was absolutely lamb blasted for saying the most obvious, basic things. Because we've, we've built that cocoon. And we've got to break out of it. And the best way to break out of it, you asked specifically about Georgia, I'm just saying we've the best way to break out of it is not listen to Washington, not listen to talk radio, not listen to cable news. Go knock on doors and see what your neighbors are saying. Go to church. See what your neighbor's saying. Go to synagogue. See what your neighbors are saying. Go to PTA meetings. See what your neighbors are saying. And guess what? What matters to them matters to the voters in the district. So. Yes, sir. Hold on one second. I'm coming to you. I'm going to be Oprah. Look under your chairs. Thank you. Um, so you're talking about how we need to market away from wealthy Americans and towards like the you know, 18-year-old Latino. Um, but how do you market the idea of entitlement reform and lower taxes to somebody who benefits probably tremendously from government welfare and probably doesn't pay much federal income tax? Okay, um, well the first part, I'm not saying run against the wealthy. Um, I, I think one of, one, of the, one of the things that, well one of the great lies Democrats have pushed is the Republican Party is a party of the wealthy. No, not really. You look at some of the richest Americans, certainly on Wall Street, they're disconnected from us socially. They don't get us, which is why you have so many hedge funders. I mean, Barack Obama did extraordinarily well on Wall Street in 08 and again on 12. And 12. As far as entitlement reform goes, it's pretty simple. The numbers just don't add up. This isn't about ideology, it's about math. When FDR passed you know, Social Security in 1933, 1934, you know, life expectancy was 62. You didn't get your first Social Security check till you were 65. It's pretty good. I mean, that's a program even a conservative. Give me, you, you know, pay, write in your, you know, write checks to the government your entire life, and then you die before you get the, the benefit. But Americans started living longer, and there were 15 people that were working for every one person on Social Security in the 1950s. There are three people working for every one person on Social Security and Medicare now. There are going to be two people working for every one person on Social Security and Medicare in 10 years from now. The numbers don't add up. It's not about ideology. It's about math. It's not about liberalism. It's about math. It's not about conservatism. It's about math. The numbers don't add up. And we've got to have the guts to tell Americans that. And they'll do the right thing. As far as taxes go, um, you know, I, 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 I said what I said about the wealthy. Um, you know, billionaires paying 14, 15% tax rates. 
I also think it's a problem when you have 50% of Americans not paying any income tax at all. We've got to broaden out the tax base. We've got to make it fair, but we've got, you know, we, we've, got to get, we've got to get more Americans actually paying income taxes. You get to a point, we keep moving in this direction, Soon you'll have 40% of Americans paying income taxes and 35% of Americans 30. At that point, you're right. There is absolutely no economic incentive for tax cuts for the, the great majority of Americans, and that'll allow the federal government to raise taxes on, you know, the small percentage of Americans who are creating the most jobs. So I think, I think we have to look at fundamental tax reform, flatten the tax code, expand the base, and get more Americans uh, paying into the paying in, but obviously because I'm a conservative at a lower rate. Yes. Um, earlier, you mentioned Jeb Bush, and yeah. recently on your show in the morning, it feels like you've been mentioning Jeb Bush every day. So, so would you say I'm in love with Jeb Bush? I, I think that's I'll true. admit it now. <laughs> Would you say that you're nudging him on to run? And off of that, what do you think the purpose of a talk show or a morning show should be? And how well do you think your show is fulfilling that goal? Um, I can answer all of these questions. <laughs> Though I'm not sure that they were asked in, you know, in the kindest of, uh, with the kindest of intentions. You know, Jeb, I, I've got a... If Jeb's last name was, were Smith, I'd be far more excited. I do have a problem with two families dominating American politics, presidential politics for 20 years. I just do. I, I, I think Barbara Bush is right. There are more than two families in America. Uh, so, but, I mean, if the choice is Herman Cain or Jeb Bush, I'm going with Jeb. <laughs> if, if the choice is Michelle Bachman or Jeb, I'm going with Jeb. Uh, I, I would add some other names there, but I don't want to offend anybody. Um, the next question is morning show. What should morning shows be? I think morning shows should be exactly like our morning show is. Uh, I actually, I wish there were more cable news shows, more broadcast news shows that were like our show, because I'll tell you what worked with our show is Meek and I said early on, we're not going to play TV. We're not going to play Voice of God. We're not going to pretend that we are ideologically disconnected, that we don't have beliefs. Because it is, you know, the great lie are all of these news people that go on and say, well, you know, I'm an independent and, and blah, blah, blah. No, they're not. Mika will tell you in the mainstream media, they're all Democrats. I've been working in mainstream media for 10 years now. I would guess if I had to, of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people I know, who are my friends? These are my friends. These are the people I work with. These are the people I invite over to Christmas parties. These are people that know my children. I like these people. I love these people. Maybe 1% are pro-life. Maybe 1% are pro-Second Amendment. Maybe 1%, but they would never admit it, support traditional marriage and are against the concept of gay marriage. Maybe. Now, I don't know what your views are on those three topics. It's not really relevant. But don't get on TV and just act like, well, the only way to do this is to pretend that you're objective and not tell people whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. That's not the honest way to do it. That's not the transparent way to do it. And while the media always talks about transparency, they're the least transparent when the camera's turned on them. So Meek and I decided early on, I would tell people exactly what I believed. She would tell people exactly what she believed. And we wouldn't play television. Uh, and I think it's made a big difference. Because when I criticize the Republican Party, people know that that's coming from a Republican. When Meek criticizes the Obama White House or Democrats, they know that's coming from somebody. You know, it, it has a little more strength and it has a little more resonance. I also think it's important, you know, Bob Woodward said early on when he came on the show, he, he said, you know, I go on CNN and they give me four minutes, they call me the night before, they say these are the four questions that we're going to do, and it's, he said, it's very rigid, it's very intellectually stifling. 
He said, I love your show. And the reason Bob loves the show is he comes on set and he goes, what are we talking about today? And I look down at the papers. I go, I don't know. What do you want to talk about? I go, let's talk about Afghanistan. I go, okay. And that's, that's what we do. We had, we, had, we had one journalist come on at the very beginning. She'd come on and every time she would say, you know, what are we talking about today? And we go, we're, we're just kind of talking about what's in the newspaper. What are we? And every time, so I'm finding about the third time, <laughs> she said, what are we talking about today? I didn't get a briefing. And Mika picked up the papers and she threw it at us. She goes, here, we're talking about what's on the front page of the damn newspapers. And that's the thing, you know, we don't really know where the conversation's going to go. Um, it, it's, it's whatever we think is most important at the time, wherever the conversation takes us. And I think that's important. We, you know, we can have Dr. Brzezinski on to talk 15 minutes about Syria. We can have Richard Haas on to talk 15 minutes about what's going on in Ukraine. And we do. So, and so the final, your other question was, how are we doing? Fantastic. <laughs> We're kicking ass, kicking ass. Yes, sir. Question. Questions about Chris Christie. Um, yeah, I like Chris. I've always liked Chris Christie a lot. Meek and I have we've been personal friends with Chris. Chris came to us and you know was asking us whether we thought he should run in 2012. He came early on, and we've had a great relationship with him. Um, I. I think he's. I, I think he's. Uh, <laughs> I think he's going to have a hard time, uh, and I think he's going to have a hard time because he's got in so many investigations going on that it's going to be. Um, I think it's going to take up most of his time just making sure that he remains governor of New Jersey uh, instead of president of the United States. Now, I do think if all of these investigations clear him in the next six to nine months, he'll still have time to go out, and it may even strengthen him. But there remains the question of whether it, he's just taking on too much water here. Are you a Chris Christie fan? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I love it. Yes. Is anybody here a Chris Christie fan? Uh, we got a few Chris. Okay, how, how many Jeb fans? Okay, how many Rand Paul fans? Okay, we got one, two. There you go. Okay, be proud. 90 miles an hour, high in the air. Ted Cruz fans. We got an oh God, but we have one, two. So you've two. Let's see, who else do we have? Am I missing anybody? Scott Walker. I like Scott Walker. We got some Scott Walker fans here. Good. Paul Ryan. You like Haley Barber? Okay. There you go. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. So my question is, you're talking about how parties, Democrats and Republicans, aren't any meaner to each other now than they were when you were in Congress. It right. has to do with trust. So looking to the future of like the two-party system in this country in D.C., do you see that trust being remedied somehow, or do you think we're going to hit rock bottom before yeah. anything can change? You know... I mean, if they're Democrats in the audience, you're not going to like my answer. I happen to be a Democrat, okay, but yeah. I love your show. Okay, thank you very much. So you've probably heard me say this on the show, and you, you <laughs> probably hate it in the morning. You'll hate it when you're here in the <laughs> afternoon as well. Um, so much of it starts at the very top. It really does. You have in Barack Obama a guy who, unlike Bill Clinton and unlike Ronald Reagan and even George W. Bush, you have a guy who never really had to deal with with the other party in a real meaningful way. Bill Clinton had to deal with conservatives and Republicans his entire life. That's why after he got knocked down in 1994, he was able to come back in 95 and figure out what conservative issues, to, and he literally just pick them out of our pocket. You read Bill Clinton's biography, and it's like 8,000 pages. What are the two things he brags about? Balanced budget and welfare reform. He vetoed our welfare bill two times before we kept sending it back. Finally, the third time, he's like, damn, I'm going to have to sign this. And so he did. <laughs> and then he took credit for it. <laughs> I fought Republicans for welfare reform. <laughs> really? <laughs> and balancing the budget. He shut down the government. He vetoed 
every appropriation bill that we sent to him. Then he blamed us for shutting down the government because we'd stopped sending him CRs. We balanced the budget. I was there. We fought like hell to do it. And then he took credit for it. But he was smart enough to get ahead of the curve. He was smart enough. He knew when to strike the deals with us. And he could get it done. George W. Bush, even when George W. Bush's popularity was in like the 20s, he figured out how to get things through the House and the Senate. With Barack Obama, the fact is, you know, I, I've had all, all these friends from early on in the Obama administration saying he's the most dangerous man in America. He's going to destroy America. He is. He's a left-wing fanatic. He's like Solowinsky. I'm like, he's not that smart. <laughs> he doesn't know how to work Washington, and he doesn't. And by the way, do you know who I hear this from the most? Democratic senators. They are so frustrated that he doesn't know how to work the system any better than he does. So my answer to your question is, I'm not saying this just to knock Barack Obama. So much of it starts at the top. And it starts with a leader who's strong enough to bring both sides in and figure out how to hammer out compromise. And believe me, with a home field advantage that you have at the White House and with a power that a president has, you can figure out a way to get things done. Barack Obama, though, he invited Republicans to a Super Bowl, and for three years, he'd say, I invited them to the Super Bowl. I can't figure out why. They're not going to, you know, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's an ongoing fight, it's an ongoing battle. And the thing that surprised me about Barack Obama is he's actually shocked that Republicans are trying to knock him down. As I always told my family, like, you know, they go, why are people writing such awful things about you on the internet? <laughs> I said, well, listen, if you would like me to be an insurance defense lawyer in Pensacola, Florida, we can go back. <laughs> I can get off a of TV. But if you step into a boxing ring, don't be surprised when they knock your head off or when they try to. And the Obama administration too often uh, is just shocked, shocked that Republicans are trying to win the next election. Hey, first of all, let's say bye to Chris Christie's surrogate. Thank you, sir, for coming. I'll, I'll, I'll send the good word on to Chris for you. I understand. I understand. I'll, I'll tell Chris. Yes, ma'am. We've got a real, I can tell we've got a real conservative over here. If you would comment on um, oh, Cheryl Atkinson's departure from CBS and her recent revelations about why she left. Yeah, I, I listen, it's really, really hard to be a conservative at a mainstream news network. It just is. I mean, she, I know she had some battles with the executive producer of the evening news. I know, I know a lot of people that run CBS over there, and they're good people, but it's just, you know, this, this liberal bias has been sort of baked in the cake for 30, 40, 50 years. And it's tough for conservatives, especially in that situation, um, to thrive. I mean, you know, with our show, they, they put us on a separate floor. We're on the second floor of 30 Rock. We're kind of called our own terror cell. We, we don't mix or mingle with the primetime people. Uh, we make NBC so much money that we have free range. I, you know, nobody in seven years has ever called me or would ever dare call me and tell me what to do on the show. If I were a correspondent for, the, for nightly news, I, I would be pulling my hair out. It's, it's really, really tough. And I don't blame, I don't blame her at all for leaving. It's, there's just a level of skepticism that Cheryl Atkinson's stories would get that Lyra Logan's stories would not get. And that's always, that's always the case. Um, it's, it, it, you know, it's changing. It's, it's better than it was 10 years ago. You know, the Fox effect actually has had an impact, a positive impact, on broadcast networks, that they understand there actually is a market 
for having some conservatives in an organization. And so there is, you know, and it doesn't usually take more than a couple of people in a well-placed in an organization to make a difference. And I think we're starting to see a difference being made. You know, when they would pitch stories at MSNBC in my early years there, I'd just start laughing. And they go, what? I go, never mind. They go, what, what, what? And I go, you guys are just clueless. You have no idea what 90% of Americans think when you talk this way. And so I think that's happening in the broadcast networks too. Yes, sir. Will Republicans take the Senate? I haven't said this on TV. I'm kind of skeptical. I'm getting, I'm getting a little nervous, to be honest with you. Um, and I'm getting nervous because, you know, first of all, Mary Landro always does well. I always joke she always figures out a way to win by six and a half votes. It drives me crazy every six years, but she just always figures out how to win. I also think there's a, there might be, a, I, we may be a little overconfident right now. Uh, you've got people, I talk about the fact that we need to be a, a, a bit sharper intellectually and have a sharper message. Um, I think a lot of candidates just have reflexively been running against Obamacare. That's not going to be enough to get them elected. Um, and um, does that mean you agree or you disagree? No, I agree. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, and so... I certainly hope we do, but, but I think right now, if you ask me today, I would tell you six picking up, you know, six or so seats is an uphill lift. And I didn't feel that way a week ago. A week ago, I was pretty sure we were going to do it. Um, but we'll see. I mean, a new, a new series of polls came out. Uh, Pryor's doing much better in Arkansas than we expected. Um, and Begich in Alaska is doing pretty well. And, of course, Mary in Louisiana is always going to be a problem. But, but you never know. I mean, it depends what happens over the summer and what happens over the fall. Okay, listen, thank you guys so much uh, for having me. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, hope to see you again soon.